Everything that's worth anything costs you something. When our kids were growing up, they really wanted a kitty cat. And so we finally broke down and went to Petco and got one of the cats that were like a rescue cat. And so we explained to the kids, if you want a cat, that's great, but you're going to have to feed it, and you're going to have to take care of it and change its litter box because dad's not going to do it. And that's all fine and good, and, you know, kids are like, yeah, we'll do it. And we all know how that story goes, right, moms and dads? <laughs> but now they do feed and empty the litter box all by themselves, and it's great. Dad still hasn't done it. Anything or everything that is worth anything costs something. When you wanted to play an instrument and your parents bought you your first, whatever, guitar, trombone, well, you're going to have to take care of it. You're going to have to practice it, and you're going to have to perform. Are you willing to count the cost of playing an instrument? Or owning your own house is a great thing, but there is upkeep. You're going to have to mow the lawn. You're going to have to fix things when it breaks, but there's great benefits to owning your own place. Marriage is another one of those amazing things that are worth it's worth so much, but it costs also so much. As you're saying your vows, and the pastor says, forsaking all others, and in sickness and in health, you know, the, the great vows to lay down your life for the one that you love. If all these things in our lives that are worth anything will cost us something, then how much more the greatest thing that could ever happen in our lives. And that is meeting Jesus Christ. And beginning an eternal relationship with Him. And so what we see here today, in a sense, is Jesus saying, okay, if you want to follow me, here's what it's going to cost. There are great benefits and eternal rewards and eternal life and forgiveness but it's going to cost you everything. We talk about receiving the death of Christ for us on the cross, but there's also the reality of the cross that we are called to carry. You too will have to carry a cross. And that's what we see today. And so the first thing in verse 23, we see this daily decision to follow Jesus. It says, and he said to all, if any would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Notice who he's saying this to. It's not just the twelve. It is to the crowds, the multitudes that are around him that like what they see and they are having fun eating all that food when he fed the 5,000 with a little bit of fish, a little bit of loaves, and he multiplied them in his hands. You know, everything was great. But he said to all of them, if you want to come after me, here's three things you got to do. If you want to be his disciple, if you want to be a believer in Jesus Christ. It's like Christ draws a line in the sand and separates those who are truly his followers from make-believers. Saying, if you, want to, if you want to come after me, here's the side that you need to be on. And so, first, he says, deny yourself. Deny yourself means to set aside your own interests, for the sake of God's kingdom. It means willing to obey the Lord no matter what the cost to you. Relinquishing 
control of your own life to the Lord. When we talk about denying ourselves, it's not just denying ourselves certain things. Some celebrate um, Lent, and it's a good thing if you feel convicted to do so. And so sometimes people deny themselves certain things like coffee or television or whatever it may be, and that's great and all, but that's not ultimately what it means to deny yourself. It's not just the denial of certain things. It's denial of yourself. Now think about that. It's not just saying no to things you enjoy. It's saying no to yourself for the sake of Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's another verse that I really enjoy that encapsulates this idea of denying yourself. In Philippians 3.7, it says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. That was my favorite verse in high school as I decided to follow Christ when I was a freshman and began to realize that following him meant denying my desire for popularity, my desire for pleasure and to party hard in this world. And so Philippians 3.7 became, for me, like my life verse in high school. As I was learning to follow Christ and learning for the first time to say no to these things and experience the social ramifications of proclaiming Christ as my Lord in a world that thinks that's weird, really. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And so when I graduated from high school, this verse carried me through so many things, and I felt like it explained all the decisions I had made and why I had lived a certain way where some people were still scratching their heads. And so when I'd sign people's yearbooks, I'd put in Philippians 3.7. And, you know, yearbooks are kind of a big thing in the news this last week, but uh, what does your high school yearbook say? Philippians 3.7 is what mine said, and, you know, I had friends like, like, what does that mean? Whatever gain you had counted as lost for the sake of Christ, I don't get it, you know. But when you walk that path, you get it. You understand what it means to lay down your life. And so, if you want to follow Christ, number one, denying yourself. Putting him first. Number two is take up your cross daily. Now, some of you guys think that like we have that phrase, well, it's my cross to bear, like my mother-in-law or whatever. My mother-in-law is great. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> or you think, you know, my health situation, that's my cross to bear, or the, the boss that I have at work, you know, or the neighborhood I live in, it's really my cross to bear. But that, that's not what it's talking about. Taking up your cross... If you want to see what that looks like in person, watch Christ. He takes up the cross and heads to Golgotha to be hung upon it. The cross is an instrument of death. It's the most, it was the most shameful death in the Roman world. So shameful that Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified. They, if they were put to death, experienced cap capital punishment, they had the dignified death of having their heads chopped off. <laughs> but if you weren't a Roman citizen and you were to be shamed, you would be crucified. And in so doing, you would have to carry that crossbar to the place of your execution. 
And so if you saw somebody carrying a cross, it wasn't for fun. It was because they were headed to a shameful death. It was a one-way journey, one which you never returned from. And so imagine when Christ said this, etched in their minds was the horror of watching people have been crucified. It was a symbol of shame, suffering, rejection. And so what Jesus is saying is, if you want to come after me, not only do you have to deny yourself, but you pick up a cross. And instead of going with the flow, you go against the flow of the flesh, of the world, and of Satan's kingdom. When we pick up that cross and follow Christ, it does mean at times that you will be rejected and hated because of Christ. And he tells us that, you know, people will hate you because they hated me. Our commitment to Christ can lead to that rejection, persecution, possible death. Now, it doesn't mean that we turn away from everything we enjoy, and then if you become a Christian, your life is just so depressing. Actually, Scripture tells us this in 1 Timothy 6, 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Notice how the godly, they don't make their things their God, but God is the God of their things. But everything that is in this life is given for us to enjoy, but not to be worshipped. So, picking up your cross following Christ does not mean you're always depressed and downtrodden, but it does mean we die to ourselves, we set aside our riches and our ungodly desires. Anything that keeps us living for him wholeheartedly, we set it aside. And so the third thing Jesus says, not only do we deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, but we also follow him. I love the way it looks to be a Christian. You know, if you're a follower of Christ, Jesus didn't invite us to a by-the-rule kind of religion or way of life where we have to memorize the rules and make sure you don't break them. Instead, he calls us to a new way of life a personal relationship with him, where we live in such a way as to please him in each situation as we follow him through our life. Our motivation becomes love for Christ, not fear of breaking the rules. And so we follow his teachings. To follow him means to hang out with his other disciples who, quite honestly, we don't always get along with. Check out the disciples in the Gospels. They didn't always agree. You had some really conservative, kind of militant guys. And then you had some more liberal um, guys that would have ticked the conservatives off, you know. But they were part of the 12. Together following Christ. And so following him means a love relationship with him, to please him in everything. It also means you're stuck with the family of God and that you abdicate the throne of your own heart and let Jesus sit on that throne as king of your life. Now, as he goes on, in verses 24 through 25, we see this second point, that your life is an offering. Your life becomes an offering of worship. In verse 24, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Now this kind of flies in the face 
of that idea or teaching that Christianity is just an enhancement to your life. That Jesus is something to make your life just a little better. As in your marriage, add a little Jesus and it becomes better. You know, your finances, you know, add Jesus to it and boom, your bank account does well. Or your reputation, whatever it is. Christianity is not just an enhancement or an additive to this life. Following Christ becomes life itself. And so notice what he says concerning that. If you want to try to save your life, if you want to make your life and yourself king and live that self-centered life, focused on this present world, saying, you know what, God, you're, you're just all right with me, but I'm going to do things my way. That's what it means to save your life. It's like to always set aside your own interests at first. If we live that way, we'll lose it, Jesus says. That temporary pleasure in exchange for eternal hell. Think of the great price that people will pay for temporary pleasure that is here for a moment and gone like a vapor. Jim Elliott, the missionary to the jungles of Ecuador, um, he was a martyr. He was killed by the very people he went to reach with the gospel, speared to death. In the shadow of the Almighty, this biography about him, written by his wife, It says that he said this, Father, take my life, yeah, my blood, if thou wilt, and consume it with thine enveloping fire. I would not save it, for it is not mine to save. Have it, Lord, have it all. Pour out my life as an oblation, which is like an offering for the world. Blood is... Only of value as it flows before thine altar. He's like, if I die to myself, it's only of value if it's for Jesus Christ and to reach this world for him. What a great heart. What an awesome understanding of what it means to die to self, but to save his life in eternity. Salvation is God's gift. Because Jesus Christ died for us on the cross, discipleship is our gift to him as we take up our cross, die to ourself, and follow him in everything. It's our offering back to him that we give him all that we are. But by seeking to avoid the potential hardships associated with following Jesus, a person could end up falling away, living for themselves and facing eternal judgment. But on the flip side, whoever loses his life for my sake, Jesus says, will save it. Give yourself to him and he will give you life. He'll give you identity. Like we talked about last week, what he created you to be when you give your life for him that come, becomes a reality. And so this life we live, though we give it freely, we experience the deepest, most profound life because it's who God created us to be. But we don't find our home here in this world, and that's why it's so backwards. It won't be that way forever. Though we experience temporary suffering today, we'll experience eternal heaven with him. And he goes on and says, what will it profit if a man gains the whole world? 
180 years after Charlemagne died, his tomb was opened in about the year 1000. Inside his tomb were incredible treasures that obviously was a great find for those who opened the tomb. But also in the tomb was his skeletal remains seated on a throne wearing a crown on his bare skull but there was a copy of the Gospels in his lap and his bony finger rested on the text. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? What a picture of oftentimes the way people choose to live their lives as their own king, but in the end losing it all. There is no profit there. But when we're willing to give it all, there's great profit. Jim Elliott, the same missionary we talked about just a moment ago, he also said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Are you grasping at things in this world so much so that you're letting loose? of your pursuit of Christ. If you become a loser now, you'll win eternally. (laughs) If you want to be a winner now, you'll be a loser forever. Part of becoming a disciple is learning this great truth and that in this life, because you belong to another place, another kingdom, Because you are God's child in the kingdom of Satan, you're going to have some difficulties. And everything seems upside down and messed up. Part of becoming a disciple is learning this reality and not being duped by the world. In Acts 14, verses 21 through 22, it says this about these early disciples. It says, when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had made many disciples, followers of Christ, who were learning to deny themselves, pick up their cross daily, and follow Jesus. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Notice that they had to continually Encourage the disciples because as they chose to follow Christ, tribulations came. Rejection, difficulties, temptations, and trials. And they had to be reminded what it means to follow Jesus Christ is to pick up your cross, deny yourself. What's happened to the church since then? The famous philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said this about his visit to a church one day. He said, I looked around and nobody was laughing. I went into church and sat on the velvet pew. I watched as the sun came shining through the stained glass windows. The minister dressed in a velvet robe, opened a golden gilded Bible, marked it with a silk bookmark and said, If any man will be my disciple, said Jesus, let him deny himself, take up his cross, sell what he has, give it to the poor, and follow me. And Soren Kierkegaard found it interesting that nobody saw the irony at the situation. May we forever be different in this world, that our lives instead of amassing a kingdom and wealth and self-fulfilling pleasures, we would become an offering poured out for God in this world. Thirdly, in verses 26 through 27, we see the importance of valiantly standing for Jesus and his word in spite of all these troubles. 
and difficulties that might come. In verse 26, it says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Notice this word ashamed. Remember when Peter was ashamed and Christ had been arrested and he was being put on trial and Peter was sitting around the fire trying to warm himself, you know. I always see that as a picture of the cold world around him. He was just looking for something warm, some sort of acceptance. And so he gathered around this fire and people were like, aren't you a Galilean? Weren't you his friend? No, I don't know the man. Three times he denies Christ. And one of the times it's a little girl that says, aren't you the guy? (laughs) And he was so ashamed. He's so scared of what even she thought. Being ashamed for Christ can take you by surprise in situations you never thought you would struggle with being ashamed. But chances are, you will be tested in that area somehow, some way. What Jesus says that we may be struggling in being ashamed of are two things. He says, of me or my words. Of me or my words. There may be a temptation to say, you know what, Jesus is cool, but... The Bible, I'm not going to take a stand on that one. But Jesus says, of me and my words. The person and the message of Christ are indivisible. And in this world, the two things that are constantly under attack are the person of Christ and the word of God. So be mindful of that. If you don't believe me, read the book of Revelation. Jesus and his words are the two causes of persecution, always grouped together. In Revelation 1.9, it says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom, in the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God. And the testimony of Jesus. Later on, and that was John during the time the gospel was written. Around 90 AD. But later, at the end of the tribulation period, in Revelation 20 verse 4. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those whom authority to judge was committed Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. If you think that those two things aren't relevant today, and you look at Revelation, it brings to reality how important it is to take a stand for those things. And we need courage to stand for Christ and not be ashamed. To hold on to his word and not let the world make you ashamed for it. We need to pray. God, make me a valiant believer with the heart of a lion, as it says in Scripture. Psalm 108, verse 13 says, With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. It's not our job to attack those who would make you ashamed of Christ and his word. God will take care of them. All you need to do is stand valiantly with a brave heart and courage. Hebrews 10, 35 through 39 says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and not delay. 
But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Amen? So, are you worried about what people think? Does the question from the little girl around that campfire make you shudder? Know that you're not alone. Peter struggled with it. But I believe God will give you strength. And Jesus gives us that warning. Don't be ashamed of me now because when I return, I'll stand for you if you stand for me. But if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And those are heavy words. But I dare not take away of the warnings from Scripture just to make us feel good. As much as it's my desire to give us that positive, uplifting, encouraging message, the warnings in Scripture stand. In verse 27 it goes on, But I tell you truly, There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And in this verse is much controversy about the various options of what Jesus could be talking about when he talks about that there will some that will not die who will see the kingdom of God. Various interpretations include the transfiguration, which Peter, James, and John will see right after this passage that we're reading right now. Um, Others see the kingdom of God as Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Others make a case that the kingdom of God that they would see would be the outpouring and growth of the kingdom through the church. Although there's all these different interpretations, I want to try to bring it down to the important parts uh, that we should hold on to. Number one, that there would be some that are standing there with Christ out of all the crowds, some that are there that will not taste death until they see with their eyes something. Now, it doesn't say that disciples wouldn't die, as some people have made up these uh, stories that the Apostle John is still alive out there somewhere, um, which I don't believe, but that they would not die before they saw something. But that also implies that some would not see something. So there's something that's going to be visible to some and not to others. And that thing is the kingdom of God. I don't believe this is speaking of the second coming of Christ since that hasn't happened yet and the apostles have passed on. They're not on this earth anymore. Jesus has not returned. So what is the kingdom of God? Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. And so there's this aspect of God's kingdom where it is here but not Yet, there are glimpses given of the kingdom, but it has not come to this earth in its full sense yet. And so, those glimpses that had been seen, I think, is what the emphasis is here. That some will see with their eyes evidence of the kingdom of God right before them. It makes me think of Thomas when he missed the first post-resurrection appearance of Christ. Jesus showed up to the apostles behind closed doors and Thomas wasn't there. And he comes back and they're like, Thomas, you missed it. Jesus came and he was so upset. And so we pick this up in John 20 verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside and this time Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. I would imagine Thomas was like, oops. He heard what I said. But Jesus says, do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There are some that were standing with Christ that saw with their eyes the risen Christ. To me, that makes the most sense. You can't have the kingdom without the king. But in this verse, we also have an inkling of the promise that though we may not see, yet we believe one day we will see, though. Following Jesus is not always suffering and death. There is a day where he will return. And his kingdom will come crashing into this world. And it will be undeniable and seen by every eye. And those who suffered for him will be glorified with him. But suffering always comes before the glory. And if you don't believe it, ask an Olympic athlete who suffers through diet and exercise and training and then finally the competition and eventually the glory. God's kingdom is somewhat like that. Suffering always comes before the glory. But that day will come and you will see with your eyes what you now experience with the eyes of faith. So, pretty intense verses, aren't they? But to me, as a young Christian, and even today, these verses bring like a passion to my heart with Jesus. I used to share these verses with my friends, or um, when I was a young youth pastor, share them with the youth group, and I was confused why people weren't as excited about them as I was. Man, we're going to pick up a cross, we're going to die to ourselves, and we're going to lose our life, but in doing so, we're going to save it. It's really hard to hear the crowds go, yeah, let's do it. But I think for me, it's so amazing and so exciting because when you love Christ so much for all that he's done for you, how could you not give him all that you are for him? In this life, you need something worth living for. And if you've tried living for yourself, in pampering the flesh, in pleasing the crowds, perhaps you've come to the end of yourself and realized how empty that actually is. That's not worth living for. There's something much greater worth living for. And that thing that's worth living for is also worth dying for. Martin Luther once said this, A religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. Is your faith worth dying for? Is Jesus Christ your greatest treasure, greatest love. And so as we ponder these verses, three thoughts for us today. Number one, daily decide to follow Christ. Before your feet hit the floor and you roll out of bed and your feet hit that carpet, pray, Lord, let this day be a day where I pick up my cross and follow you. But if you're like me, there are some mornings 
when you get ready to have your feet hit the floor and you think about the day before and you're like, you know what, I was not the best disciple yesterday. <laughs> I didn't follow Christ the way I had hoped. But that's why I think Jesus says daily, we daily do this. But we have this great hope in Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And when you start out your day, each day, there may be regrets from the day before and sins to confess, but God's mercies are new. And he'll meet you there and give you the strength and the dignity and the forgiveness that we need to start afresh each and every day. Number two, pour out your life as an offering. You know the way Paul talked about his life and his ministry is really cool. It says in Philippians 2.17, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice or sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. He poured out his energy, his time, his comfort. But what does it result in? Gladness and joy. That's a life worth living, being poured out as an offering for God. I always think about that phrase in Braveheart. Everyone dies, but not everyone truly lives. You know what I'm talking about? It makes you want to go, yeah, and run out onto the battlefield in your kilt, you know. But Jesus offers something more than that. He gives us a life that counts for eternity. But thirdly, stand for Jesus and his word in season and out of season. Because truth be told, there will be times when people are favorable towards Jesus and his word. We've had times in our own country where it has been more favorable to be a follower of Christ. There, there are places in the country where it's more favorable than the Northwest <laughs> to claim to be a Christian. But there are also times when you'll experience hostility. In season and out, stand for Jesus and his word. I think of the first time publicly in school where I stood for Christ. There was this movie out called The Last Temptation of Christ, and it was really kind of blasphemous and showed Jesus like being tempted sexually with Mary Magdalene and all this stuff, and it was like, whoa, this is way out there. And our teacher, you know, he was a, he was a good hippie, and... Uh, but he also was like, he wanted to show this in class. And so he's like, hey, is, does anybody have a problem with this? And we just talked about it at a youth group the day before. There was a couple of kids that had been Christians for years before me. Um, I was a brand new Christian. They were there in my class. And I was like looking around like, are you guys going to say anything? <laughs> and nobody said anything. And before I knew it, my hand was in the air. I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> what am I doing? And I knew this guy was really harsh towards Christians and stuff. And I was like, okay, here it goes. He goes, okay, why? And then I just started talking, you know. I'm not exactly sure what I said, but I remember saying something like, Jesus loves you and died for you. And he wouldn't do the things that are in this movie, you know. And the great thing is he's like, okay, well, then we won't watch it. And I was surprised. And from that day on, you know, he actually respected me instead of attacked me, which also surprised me. 
But there are tests that will come. When you least expect it, will you stand for Jesus in his word in season and out? Bigger tests, bigger opportunities will come. Begin in the little, the little things. Begin in the hard attitudes. And when those tests come, you'll be ready. So I don't know about you, but reading these verses, they kind of reignite my passion to follow Jesus Christ and be a Christian in this dark world. They're words of hope, not words of death, words of life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and pray that you would ignite all of our hearts with that heart of a true disciple. That we would follow you through anything. Lay our lives down, pour our lives out for your sake, Jesus. Let us have that eternal perspective. Let us know this world is not our home. And let us live like citizens of heaven in the face of a hostile world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.